I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You never can be yet. He's still moving mountains, baby. He's still doing what needs to be done. Every single day, big stuff, little stuff, he's got it all. And I thank God this morning, he's still moving those mountains, still working. Praise God. I've seen you move, you move the mountain, and I believe I'll see you do it again. You made a way where there was no way, and I believe. I'll see you do it again. I've seen you move. You move the mountain. And I believe. I'll see you do it again. You made a way where there was no way. And I believe. I'll see you do it again. I'll see you do it again. still stands. Great is your faithfulness, faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You never failed me yet. And I never will forget. You never Yeah. 
circumstances today by your spirit and by your power and honor you for it and we thank you for it today in Jesus name everybody said amen. Amen. amen God bless you you can be seated this morning thank the Lord he is worthy so so worthy today I'm starting a new series Hello, good morning. All right. We are blessed and favored, and I tell you, God just continues to bless and continues to touch us and help us and encourage us and do uh, amazing and wonderful things for us. And the the just the way I think God is working right now, there's several things that I that just God's really got going on for uh, for my life and for my heart and my my own personal experience, alone that as a pastor. 
And I'm excited. I am just so excited about what I feel like God is up to and what God is doing uh, in our church and through our church. And uh, give me just a second here while I do something that uh, will make sure that things are working like they're supposed to here. And it appears that they might be. Um, it's hard to tell, but anyway, our internet is not always the best, and that's the trouble. So if you're watching this morning over the internet with us, uh, and it's not great, I apologize. I can't do anything about that. I've got the equipment, and I've got the resources, but right now, it doesn't look like everything is cooperating with me, so um, we do apologize for that. And uh, we're just working on the fly this morning. It's all good, and uh, that'll, that'll give us what we want right there. Today, we're going to start talking about being convinced. To be convinced, simple process, simple thought. If you know something, it's because somebody's convinced you that that's true, um, whatever it may be. And I use illustrations like this once in a while. It may be something like what kind of car you drive. Um, most of us, um, I would say for me, I know because I thought about this yesterday, um, as I was trading vehicles, we traded. Uh, it's, they're pretty good over there. When you go over for an oil change, a free lifetime oil change that I did have on the other, on the black rig, um, that we, it's now white, and it's the same kind of vehicle, the same, it's just newer and, and, and better, but uh, we, uh, so they, they went over and they looked at stuff and they said, we can do this for you, we do that for you, and I was like, okay, let's do that, so um, I drove home in a new car yesterday, so it was, it's nice, and it's, it's just what we had, just different color, but um, anyway, why do I drive a Chevy? Well, because I'm an American and I love Jesus. No, I'm kidding. Uh, that's, that's a little much. For those of you who are driving Fords this morning, you know, Jesus loves you too. Just, um, it's just different. But but in all seriousness, Dad had a, Chev a Chevrolet Chevelle, 67 Chevrolet Chevelle Super Sport, and that car, Midnight Blue, that car was no more because of a woman in a cream-colored Cadillac that ran a stop sign and we T-boned her. And this scar right here that you can see when you're talking to me that used to be up in my hair. It's like it's moved down my forehead for some reason. Uh, that scar is the result of that. I went through the windshield, and before we hit her several times on the trip, Dad had said, Jim, this is back when we were worried about seat belts and car seats. I was about seven, and I was sitting, I was sitting, we had bucket seats, and I'm sitting the best place in that car. My brother got to sit in the front seat. Big deal. So what? You all, you got the front seat. I'm in the middle of the back seat. I can see the world right there. And uh, so, I, you know, I'm sitting, and every little bit, Dad says, son, get behind. And he says this all the time. And, and you know, I... I, uh, it's just, you know, sometimes real hard, hard to learn it. And, uh, he said, son, get behind it because if we have to hit something or somebody, you'd go through the windshield. Well, guess what? Dad was right. That was hundred percent true. And I, we proved that theory that absolutely I went through the windshield and, uh, woke up in, in the arms of this lady that I didn't know from anybody and looked up at her and she's telling me it's going to be okay. And I said, no, it's not. And I could see blood. Now, at seven years, well, at 50 years old, but at seven years old for sure, when I saw blood, it's over. The tears are coming. Even if it's no, even if it don't hurt, blood's bringing tears. Somebody else's blood might bring tears. Man, that's how, that's how crazy I was about that. But, but uh, anyway, so, so, but Dad had that Chevrolet Super Sport, 66, beautiful car. Wish I still had it. And then Mom and Dad had a, uh, a Chevy uh, Impala. Back when the doors weighed as much as most cars weigh now, you remember those humongous doors? It was a two-door, but it, it had more room. You could get easier into that back seat through that two-door Impala, 69 Impala, than you can a four-door car today. I mean, it, you open that door, and you could, you, could put a, you could put one of these pews inside the back seat back there, and the humongous. So Chevy's the thing. Now, Grandpa had Fords, and how I didn't get, that, get caught up in that, I don't know. But, but it's always been a Chevy for the most part. Um, I've had Chevy trucks, Chevy, uh, GMC, Chevy stuff. And like there's nothing wrong with the rest of it necessarily. It's all, it all comes from the same source somewhere. But, uh, but at any rate, we have our preferences. This is, this is how we know. Why? Because we're convinced based on something that that is what I want to drive. Talking about cars. That I want to drive a Ford. I want to drive a Chevy. I want to drive a Dodge. I want to drive whatever. Toyota, because you can drive them for a hundred thousand, hundred, hundred goes a thousand miles and, Never change oil, never do anything. It'll keep running for you, apparently. But no, you have to change oil. I'm kidding. But, but you know, and whatever else. I mean, you, you name it. Whatever it is, there is a reason why you are convinced that that is the brand or the, the whatever, the clothes you wear. Why do you wear the clothes you wear? You like the style, you like whatever. Well, probably somebody's influenced you. And it's probably in Milan, which apparently is a place over in Italy where they do a lot of funny clothes. But anyway, 
Um, it's not funny. I mean, if somebody has up with Milan this morning, I apologize to you. But, uh, but, but we're convinced. How do we get convinced? We have the information. We get the knowledge. We get the data. And then we make up our minds based on what we've, what we've heard, what we've seen, other people's experiences, other people's testimonies. And that's how we know. But I'm going to tell you something here this morning. Regardless of how you came to know Jesus, I will promise you one thing. The Holy Spirit was involved, had to be involved, and could not not be involved. The Holy Spirit had to be involved in you knowing Jesus. Now, you may have watched your mama, your grandma, your grandpa, your neighbor, your somebody that convinced you or helped you make the decision to become a believer in Jesus Christ. This morning, I had the privilege a, little, a few minutes before church. Hunter Dury sat right down here on this altar with me, and we prayed and asked Jesus into his heart. We'll baptize him later on, probably in July, maybe August. We'll look at the dates and see. But I'm excited and proud of Hunter this morning. God, just God bless you, Hunter, and I'm excited about that. And before we ever had church this morning, we only had one saved today in the house. I thank God for that. Mm -hmm. I'm glad for this young man. And uh, pray for him. He, he needs all your prayers that he's going to live a good life for Jesus. But but uh, that's exciting and wonderful. But how did he get there? He watched his mom and dad. He's watched both sets of his grandparents. He's watched his pastor, of course. And he's watched, he's watched you know people that in his life that have convinced him, I need Jesus. I need to ask Jesus in my heart. And we had a good conversation before about what it means and what it's about and what for. And you understand it. Absolutely. So I said, all right, let's pray and ask Jesus in your heart. So we did that. What a beautiful thing. And what a wonderful morning it was to do that. But he got convinced. And you got convinced. But the Holy Spirit was involved in that convincing. So what we're going to talk about over the next several, over the next several weeks is going to be the Holy Spirit's work of convincing. Because the Holy Spirit has that job, has that responsibility that Jesus lays out in John chapter 16. In John chapter number 16, you're going to see here, which this is familiar to us. I preached some of this before, at least from this passage numerous times. If you're going to be Pentecostal and don't preach about the Holy Spirit, then you're, well, you may be, uh, you may be something else and don't know it. You just, you just think you're Pentecostal. But we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit in some detail, and we're going to look at what his job is. Because the Holy Spirit's work, the work of the Holy Spirit is the key aspect of everything we are ever going to do that has to do with the kingdom of God. There is nothing that we'll do as a church to reach this world for Jesus in any way, shape, or form that the Holy Spirit is not involved in. Any church that's doing anything for God on this planet will always have the Holy Spirit's input and activity in that in, in what they're doing. If he's not a part of it, they're just they're just 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 doing doing whatever. They're doing their own plan, doing their own thing. And I don't have a problem with programs. I don't have a problem with making plans. We love to do things. We do our, we got kids ministry and Sunday school stuff. Once we get everything back in order here and back to normal, we've got all those things that we do. Those are wonderful things. But if we're just doing those things because there are things that the church is supposed to do and they are not ordained and anointed and blessed and active through and through the power and with the power of the Holy Spirit, then we're just, we're just saying words and just doing stuff that don't mean anything anywhere at any time. We must, we must have the Holy Spirit as an active part of everything we're doing. He desires to be. He lives with you. He took up residence in your heart whenever you became a believer in Jesus Christ. And those that have received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you have gone to that next place in your life where you have now available to you the gifts and the work of the Holy Spirit. We all have, if we're believers, we all have the fruit of the Spirit available to us and working in us. And thank God we have what we have. Thank God we can do what we can do in the power and the work and the wonder of the Holy Spirit. It is amazing. It's incredible. And you know, the Holy Spirit, he, he, he is, he's the unsung hero for the most part in what God is doing on this planet. Now, we acknowledge him. We talk about him. Of course, most Trinitarians will talk about Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And they'll baptize in the name of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit. And they'll do all those kind of things. But at the end of the day, how involved is the Holy Spirit in what they're doing? For us, we need to sit back and take inventory. How involved is the Holy Spirit in what we're doing? If he's not the center of what we're trying to accomplish, what we're going to accomplish is going to be empty and hollow and pointless because it will not have the anointing of God on that because that's the Holy Spirit's job. The Holy Spirit's primary job that he does and every work that he does, and we're talking about the work of the Holy Spirit, everything he does will point us to Jesus. Why? Because Jesus is the only thing in this universe that can do anything for us, that will help us know to, to, to know God, will help us to know a place in heaven and have a home there. The only thing that's going to do anything for us in our lives ever at all is going to be the power of the Holy Spirit working in us to point us to Jesus, to bring us to God, and to have that relationship. And so much of the world just doesn't get it. 
You can go to a lot of churches across this land today or watch their, their broadcast or their stream or their television ministry, whatever, and the Holy Spirit is either never mentioned or seldom mentioned. If he is mentioned, it's just in passing. It's just that the Holy Spirit, or they may be a Trinitarian church and may mention Father, Son, Holy Spirit once in a while. But friends, if we don't have the Holy Spirit working in us, our relationship with Jesus Christ will not be everything that it can be. Amen. It won't be. It can't be. It's impossible. Because without the work of the Holy Spirit in your life every single day, and I'm going to prove this to you beginning this morning and over the next several weeks as we talk about what Jesus says in John 16, 7 through 11, what the Holy Spirit is doing in the world. Because Jesus is speaking to his disciples, and, who is he, and what has he given them? He's given them this word, and as much of the New Testament is, there's certainly that directed toward the unbeliever, but there's much of this that is directed toward you and I as believers in Jesus. We are, we, are, we, are, we are in a relationship with him, and as a person that has a relationship with him, the Holy Spirit is helping that relationship grow. Because he's a comforter, he's a teacher, he's a guide, he's a helper. What does, he, what does he do? He teaches us about Jesus, he guides us to Jesus, he helps us in the things of Jesus, all of those things he does. But I want to show you a couple things specifically this morning that we're going to talk about having to do with sin. Yes, I said sin, because we talk about sin around here. We're not, we're not like those folks on television that think that that's unseemly and people don't like that. It's a turnoff, right? Well, if, I, if this is a, a quote-unquote turnoff to you this morning, then get out your phone and go ahead and start playing Candy Crush or whatever you want to because you're not going to get anything out of this. But if you'll listen and pay attention, and I'm going to tell you something this morning. I don't think we have a massive sin problem sitting in the room today, as far as I, as far as I know. Uh, but, but if there is a sin issue in your life, here's what I've learned about me. I'll, I'll, I'll use me. Over the course of my life in Jesus since 1992, there have been occasions where there was things that were part of my life that did not belong there as a believer in Jesus, let alone as a pastor. Confession is good for the soul. I wasn't just, you know, out, you know, I, well, anyway, I wasn't just, just, you know, on, on, you know, on that one-way trip to hell or anything. It wasn't like that. It was just things. What, what did the word say? The little foxes full of the mind. Because what happens? We've been talking about the deeds of the Nicolaitans. The deeds of Nicolaitans on Wednesday nights in our Bible study. And if you're not able to catch that live, watch it later because there's some good stuff we're, we're, we're seeing right there in the book of Revelation. And you can see most of it's on YouTube now and available there um, as I load them up after we, after we do them on Facebook. But um, what I what I really want to get across here uh, is I got distracted by this stupid thing on my ear um, is that the deeds in the Nicolaitans. I'm, I'm going to focus on this just for a minute, but you've heard if you've watched the Wednesday nights, you've all heard it. Most of you have that are here this morning. The deeds of the Nicolaitans. What is compromise? It was compromise. And guess what? Compromise is compromise. It doesn't have to be big compromise. It can be little compromise. It means a little bit of something. Because what happens? The little bit of something. Then it becomes a little bigger something, then a little bigger something. Then you've got a problem as big as your pastor this morning standing here that is just going to rule your life. I'm a little less than a one. Watch this. A couple weeks ago, what happened? So, been working, been busy, and been doing good. So I, I'm working on it. I'm getting better. Pretty soon I'll have to go to that next coat down. Praise the Lord. And it'll be wonderful. So let's get, let's get I, I've been I've been rambling and going here. Let's get to our, 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 our verse. So John chapter 16. And verse number seven, Jesus is speaking. And would, would you, if you can, please stand with me and honor the reading of this word as Jesus Christ is speaking to our hearts and lives today, yet 2,000 years after he said it the first time. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin because they do not believe in me. Of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more. And of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. Father, speak to us today through this word. Anoint me, God, to say exactly what you once said. Nothing more, nothing less than that your Holy Spirit will do his job today in me, through me, and for me to speak this word to this audience and to whoever hears this this morning or by way of the internet or later on when it's, when it's shared with them somewhere else. And we thank you and love you for it in Jesus' name. Everyone said, Amen. Amen, may it be so in Christ, you may be seated. Today we're going to talk about the simple question, what is sin? What is sin? Sin is a plague. Sin is a cancer in the body of Christ. It's a cancer of the world, but especially when it gets into the church. As I've said in 
the book of Revelation, when you're dealing with Ephesus, you're dealing with um, with Pergamos, you're dealing with Smyrna um, and Thyatira, where we've gone so far, not to mention the others, you have them dealing with the same thing. And just like for us today, let me just give you a little Revelation word here uh, for us this morning real quick, and then I'll get, get actually get to my notes because this isn't there. This is free. And uh, so you so you, you got this, and, and he says, you know what, you're doing good. You know, through the COVID, you, you know, the, the, the one that has the, uh, the internet waves over the earth says to you today that you are doing good. All through the COVID crisis, when we couldn't have church, you were watching Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, and you were there when Pastor did his little encouragement deals, and you've done well, and you've been there for the prayer meeting, and you've done this. You've done all well and good. You've been praying. You've been faithful. You've been doing good. But all but one church, then you have the next phrase. But I have this against you. Now, I don't know. I'm not going to throw this out there. wouldn't do it if I knew one, because it would be the time and the place. I'll call you. No, I'm kidding. I, I don't know any, so I, I'm not going to call you. If the Holy Spirit gives me one and your phone rings, it's me. Please answer. If you don't answer, I'm going to leave you a long, 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 long message on your phone. And I'm still not going to tell you until I talk to you in person. And, uh, but, <laughs> sorry. So, but, but Jesus, he, 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 he spoke to, the, to those churches, and he said, I've got this against you. Because you, you've got the doc, doctrine of Nicolaitan, or you've got the doctrine of Balaam, or you're Jezebel. Now, I'm going to tell you something about Jezebel. This is one of those things that stuck out in my mind. Throughout the world, there are all kinds of names that are scriptural names that are used all over the place. You've got Dinah's, and you've got, you've got all these, uh, there's even a few Tamars running around on the planet, in the English-speaking world, right? But I have yet to meet, and I don't expect I ever will, a Jezebel. Now, I shouldn't, but I'm going to. I've met some that their name might, could have been Jezebel, but that's a whole other message. That's a whole, well, we're, I'm preaching on sin, so that might fit here. No, but in all seriousness, now, let me, let me, let me come back to where I'm going with this, because I don't want to spin off and get, get chasing any more rabbits than I have to. But you know I have to. I can't help myself. But it's just like that, just like that hound dog. He's got to go. He can't just sit there and he can't just watch. He's got to go chase them down. But this, this word sin, sin is unseemly. It's awful. It's terrible. But I'm going to tell you something, if you are involved in sin, if you're dealing with sin, little sin, big sin, medium-sized sin, by our standards, what does God say? Sin is sin. Right is right. Wrong is wrong. And James, in James chapter number 4, in verse number 17, he gives us the answer. Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. Pretty simple. Pretty cut and dry. And I can tell you something, with having grandkids and foster kids and church kids and just myself, Here's what I've come to know. In the house now, we've got a two-year-old. When Lily was a year, year and a half, she'd come stay with us. Jameson's now a year and a half. We'll have them both with us next week. And next weekend, they'll be with us. You'll get to see them Friday night when we have our, uh, our, our uh, Independence Day celebration. Brittany Deb will be here, too, for that night. But um, we're excited about all that. But, but even at that, Jameson's a year and a half old. And you can look at Jameson. If he's doing something, say, boy, should you be doing that? No, he knows. If a year and a half old child knows, how come we don't? How come most grown folks don't seem to know? How come we have so much trouble keeping ourselves straight, keeping ourselves out of the messes that we find ourselves in all the time because we just can't stop doing things we shouldn't be doing. We just can't stop, uh, stop doing that stuff. And you know what? Here's the problem. If we are truly living in the spirit, which I'm going to show you this in a minute. I'm getting ahead of myself. That's okay. You're used to it by now. That, that if we are living in the spirit, we're walking in the spirit, and that last of the fruit of the Spirit, self-control. It seems like that one don't take hold on a lot of us. Of the nine fruit of the Spirit, what are the two that give us most trouble? Patience, self-control. Matter of fact, if we get one, we might have the other. <laughs> Those who kind of work hand in hand, amen, they're kind of there together. So as we think about this this morning and we look to this, we should know how to beat this thing. We have the power to beat it in Jesus. I'll wait. We have the power to beat it in Jesus. Amen. He has overcome death, hell, and the grave. He has overcome sin. He has overcome everything so that we can overcome everything. In Hebrews chapter number 12, starting in verse number 1, here's what, here's what the Hebrew wrote. Said, he said, therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. There's the phrase right there. This sin so easily ensnares us. Now, lately, with doing the stuff here on the church, we, we, we painted the face, we got the roof redone, everything's done, finally it's all done, the house is done. I had to do some painting and, and, and 
Claude helped me do that. Thank you, Claude, for that. And Dan helped with some of the, 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 the work around here and done some stuff. Made it all look better, look good. We did, we really done a good job. And it looks great. Not bragging on me, bragging on us. It's okay to do that. Don't pat yourself on the back. You hurt yourself. Just let you know. You can turn somebody else will do it for you if you get the time. But but there was a time or two when I'm using cords. And I, I don't know why I'm not videoing this because we can probably make money on that, that video show, put it on YouTube and somebody watch it. But no, undoubtedly, I don't care if there's one cord or if there's a dozen cords. My feet are going to find them. And if I'm dragging that cord somewhere, it doesn't matter what it is, where I'm going, I'm going to come around here and I'm going to get here and I, I'll get about right here. It's going to hang up on something. And I, I'll be honest with you, I've had a time or two. I'm pretty sure the devil's just busy on that because I've hung up on something. I go back and look. There's nothing to even hang up on. Man, cords are a problem. So I understand from a real sense and a real world sense what it means to be ensnared. I've been tripped up and caught up. I'll tell you something right now. You can do this. Go home today. If you've got most stuff like I have, like most people have a TV. At our, around our TV, we have the satellite deal. I have the internet boxes there. I have a game system which it's packed up to go to CJ's. I've got, usually you have a DVD player or something else. Some of you may have VHS still. Just don't, don't, don't raise your hand right there. It's not a good point. You may still have the Betamax. You may have one of those. And if they work, great. That's wonderful. But, but you've got all this stuff. Now, here's what I've done about, oh, it's been a couple years ago. I pulled that TV out, and I got all those wires. And I got some little, little uh, deals you wrap around there and tie the wires up. And I took those wires, every single one of them, and I bunched them up, and I got them small, and I wrapped them up, and I had everything just perfect back there. I mean, it looked great. It looked good. If you pull that thing out, you can look, and you say, this wire goes here, this I mean, Everything had its place. Everything's in its time. But I'm going to tell you right now, this morning when I went to unhook that game system to pack it up to tape, I promise you, as sure as I'm sitting here right now, every wire back there was wrapped around itself. Every wire, there wasn't a wire that was free or loose. The ones I pulled loose, I had to, I had to, I had to get down there physically and make sure I wasn't going to rip something else up because I was trying to get the ones I was trying to get to. I don't know why the devil wants to mess behind my TV. I don't have any idea why he wants to get back there or send demons to do it. But there's got to be something going on. There has to be something there because I can get that thing perfect and in order. I've done it back there with a sound booth. On your way out, if y'all want to say, lean over there and look. It looks like somebody backlashed a, a casting reel back there amongst those cords. It's the awfulest thing you've ever seen in your life. It's terrible. So ensnared things, we get ourselves ensnared. Watch that now. Watch this. So easily ensnares us. What's he saying? He said we get ourselves tripped up in this stuff. We get caught up in it. But I got good news for you because I wasn't done yet. Let's keep going. He said, well, let's run. run. All right, let's, let's try that one more time. This, this is why it takes me an hour and a half to record a 30-minute sermon on, on video. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus. Boom. We have the solution. We look to Jesus. He is the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. That's some of the best news you're going to hear in your whole life because he has got it laid out for you. He has got a path for you. He has got a plan for you. He has got everything laid out for you. And that plan, he knew. Now, this is such a, this is such a, one of those strange places in Scripture. <coughs> Excuse me. For the joy set before him, now, you can stop right there and say, the joy set before him that we would all go to heaven. The joy set before him that we'll have a blessed life. The joy set before him, but no, that's not, what, that's not what the Hebrew writer writes. The joy that was set before him, he, he endured the cross, despising the shame. Now, we know from what we read in Scripture and what we talk about on Easter, and if you've ever seen the Passion of the Christ, which not everybody has, and I understand that. Some people can't watch it. it it's tough to watch. I've seen it lots of times. And every time it's tears, every time it's like, I can't believe they do this to a person, let alone the Son of God. But they had to do it so that you and I go to heaven one day and have this blessed life we have. <clears throat> I'm so sorry. I'm pretty much over that what I dealt with last week, but there's just a little bit hanging on there in my throat. So we have, we have the ability in Christ. We have the ability in Christ to overcome. But do we have the willingness to overcome? Do we have the determination to overcome? Have we made up our minds that what Jesus did for us on Calvary's cross is going to be enough for us to motivate us and take us to that place where we say, you know what, sin, I don't have time for you. I don't have the energy for you. I don't have the desire for you. Let's, let's, let's set up a camp right there. I don't have the desire anymore. 
There's got to be a point in time in the believer's life where he wakes up and says, you know what, I'm tired of this stuff. I don't want this in my life anymore. I want the good things Jesus has for me, and I know I can't have both. That's right. That's right. Well, now you're preaching, preacher. If you preach with me, it sounds better to me. I'm telling you, we have this promise. We have this ability. We have all of this out in front of us. And I thought I'd come by and tell you this morning that you don't have to give in. Sin is always an option, absolutely. But make sure that you don't get confused to think that temptation is sin. Temptation is not sin. Surrender to temptation is sin. I wonder how many people, how many people that do can go to confession or do do confess their stuff. And I get people confess to me once in a while, not the way that the, the, some folks do it, but just you know, this pastor, I'm really struggling with this, and it's that kind of thing. Uh, you know, I don't have any power to absolve anybody of anything. It don't work that way, but uh, not, not not for me anyway. That's I don't have that authority in, in, in the assemblies of God at least. But but friend, I'm telling you something this morning. There are some people that come in, but pastor, pray for me. I've been tempted. I've really been tempted, and it's like they're confessing their temptation. If that's how you feel, that's how you want to do it. But I got good news for you this morning. Just because you were tempted, you are not, you're not caught up in sin. When you surrender to that sin, absolutely, you need to confess. You need to ask God to forgive you. At least confess it to him and ask him to forgive you. You don't have to tell me anything. That's up to you. But I'm just telling you something good this morning. The power of the Holy Spirit is there to convict you, to convince you, to show you there's sin in your life and that you need to deal with it. Because if we don't deal with it, God will. Amen. Ooh, man, man, I'm preaching this morning. I like what I'm saying. Keep on. Come on, preacher. I'm telling you something. There's, there's something powerful about all this. We've got to get ourselves to that place where we are convinced in every aspect of our life. Because there's a lot of people, they get convinced they need Jesus, but they're never convinced of anything else. Oh, man. I'm, let me come on this side. We, get, we need to be convinced that what Jesus desires to do every day is every day. Because there has got to be something that occurs in the heart and life of a, of a believer in Jesus Christ that says they're convinced that they need Jesus every day, that they need to grow in Jesus every day, that we need to be more sanctified every day. Because I want, I just, I love that song. I'm trying to, who is it, babe? I want to get so close to it. Um, Wayne Watson, thank you. I knew you know. Wayne Watson, he said, and I've sung it for you a little bit. It wasn't great, but I sung it. I said, you know, I want to get so close to him that it's no big change. On that day when Jesus calls my name. I love that. Yeah. That's who I want to be. I want to go from a, a victorious life in Jesus Christ to when, when when this body is laid down or this body is caught up or however it works out. I'm not concerned about it one way or the other, but whenever God calls me home, when I stand before him, I want to go from a moment of power and passion and excitement into the very presence of Jesus and him look at me and say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Lord, call me up when I'm worshiping you. And when I'm right there in that moment and the, those tears are flowing and, I, and I, open, I open up my eyes and I'm looking at you, that's what, I, I, that's what I'd like to see. That's what I'd like to have happen. Now, how do we know? Let's make sure we're clear on this because a lot of folks, you know, it's kind of those funny things with, with human beings. We're funny creatures. And you get the question once more, well, how do I know I'm saved? How do you know you're saved? What are... Number one, if you ask Jesus in your life, number and number beyond that is the infinite, really, as you really get down to it. There's a lot of questions you can ask there. But the, the, the second thing is, what are your desires? What do you want? What is it that you want out of your life every single day? What are your choices? What have you determined you're going to do today that shows that Jesus is inside of your life, that the Holy Spirit has taken up residence in your life? Galatians chapter 5, verse 19 starts off in a very negative, awful, terrible way that sadly describes much of the church and certainly describes the world. So here's what Paul writes to the Galatian church and starting in verse number 19. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies. Hold on, we got to stop there. I can preach every Apparently, I've lost a verse. Let me come back. I did lose a verse. Envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. I apologize, that didn't make the screen. I don't know what happened there. I lost, I lost part of my, my stuff out of there. It, it happened. This, this, this program is wonderful, but it's got bugs. <clears throat> Little demonic, evil bugs. And. So here we are. Let's, let's kind of go back and let's look at our list. 
Remember, who's Paul writing to? He's not writing to the bar down the street. He's writing to the church. In the church, in the church, you've got the works of the flesh. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, um, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresy. And again, you have to look at your Bible, and, and which is a good thing. Uh, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like which I tell you beforehand, just I told you in time past, those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. I don't think he meant his words there. If you want to go to heaven and you want to live a, live a life of eternity with God in his presence forever and ever in a place that's, the, that's perfect and wonderful and excellent, these things are not to be part of your life. And again, he's writing to the church. Don't forget that. That's a key aspect of this whole thing. He's writing to the church. And we know that, that when you start looking at the, the seven churches in Revelation, he's right. This is, this is them. Those people that are the doctrine of Balaam, doctrine of, of uh, the Nicolaitans, and the doctrine of, 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 of uh, Jezebel. I just wrote that he just, he, that's speaking to them. That is their life. That is their experience. Because those people are caught up in that junk. But when that word shows up in Scripture, that little three letter word, but. That's one of the most powerful words you're ever going to find. Because most of the time when you see that in Scripture, you see exactly what we're seeing right here. you got all this stuff going on, this bad junk, this stuff that you don't need to be a part of, this mess that shouldn't be a part of a believer's life, especially in the epistles, especially in the New Testament. But then he says this, and you know these well because you hear me rattle them off all the time. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, against us there is no law. And he goes on and he gives us even better news. Those who are, are, are Christ have crucified the flesh with his passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. If we're going to overcome sin on a consistent, daily, regular basis, it's going to have to come when we are walking in the Spirit. If we are walking in the Spirit, we will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. <clears throat> That's what he said. I'm just seconding. Can I get a witness? Praise God. That is the way the Word of God tells us it's supposed to work. That's the way it does work. I can tell you when I went from a drunken, foul-mouthed, jerk idiot in 1992, it took a little while that I still had some of that vocabulary I had to work out and make sure I didn't let come out of my lips. I still had the desire to drink. I still had the desire for some other stupid stuff that was sinful and wrong. But from that moment in August 23rd, 1992, until this, alcohol has not touched my lips. I will confess to you and, not, and, and say it ashamedly, there has been a time or two where a word slipped out of my mouth that shouldn't come out of a believer's mouth and certainly shouldn't come out of a pastor's mouth. God forgive me one more time because when I let that happen in frustration or anger or some other reason that kind of mess slips out of my mouth, it was, it, I don't have an excuse. There's not enough mad that I can have where God's going to say, oh, Jim, don't worry about that. I don't believe that. I believe what we say, what we do, what we think, how we act, our attitude, all of that matters yeah. as a believer in Jesus. And if it may, maybe we'll get to heaven and God says, you know, you could have. It's okay. You could have let that slip once in a while. You could have talked that way all the time if you wanted to or whatever else. I'd rather get to heaven and him, him, him say something like that than to get to heaven and say, boy, let's get you some holy soap right now. Even though you got a perfected body, you still got, we can start one more thing. You're going to, we're going to wash your mouth out with soap right here in heaven. And you know what I'd do? I'd open up and say, come on, Jesus. If that's what you need to do for me, I'll take it. But I've gotten over all that mess. That should not be a part of my vocabulary as a believer in Jesus. For, for my own life, my own, uh, my own situation, but certainly for those around me. How many times have you been around somebody that talks about church in one breath and then this cussing or telling some filthy joke in the next? It happens all the time. Yeah. Where's our standard? Where is our determination that we're going to walk in the Spirit and be what Jesus wants us to be everywhere all the time, whether we're alone or whether we're in a crowd of people? I don't care what the good time guys are doing, the locker room stuff that people want to throw in there. They can do whatever they want to do, say, what they, say whatever they want to say. But I'll point you some Old Testament right here. As for me in my house or me in this house where the Holy Spirit dwells, I'm going to serve the Lord. Yeah. Because it matters. It matters. You know why it matters? Because Jesus takes sin seriously. Jesus, I said, takes sin seriously. I want you to listen to this. I, I thought about this, and I may have preached it this way once or twice. I'm, it's possible because sometimes I even forget what I say. It's okay. We've had a time or two over the years where I'd ask my kids or, or, or someone, you know, what did, I preach, what, what did I preach last Sunday? I don't know. And the honest truth was I was asking because I didn't know. I couldn't remember. I had to look back at my notes once in a while. But I'm telling you something this morning. 
Here's what I do know. I know Jesus takes sin seriously. If you're if you're going to the Bible with me, you, you can join me there, but it's going to be on the screen for you, so I'm going to go through it. We're going to get to communion here in a few minutes. Matthew chapter 18, verse number 6. Matthew 18, verse number 6. Jesus is speaking here, of course, and he says, Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depths of the sea. Now, that's serious. That's a serious moment right there, but let's go farther. Woe to the world because of offenses, for offenses must come, but woe to the man by whom the offense comes. Now let's, 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 let's hang around here for a minute. What a world it would be if people just stopped being people and just started being right, started treating people with the golden rule, do unto others you'd have to do unto you, treat others like you want to be treated. It would not be a wonderful day. Doesn't look like from watching the news it's going to be today. Tomorrow don't look good either. We'll see what happens after that. And it's not going to get better, friends. It's just not. But Jesus himself here says, you know, he said in this world you'll have trouble, but look at this right here. Woe to the world because of offenses, for offenses must come. They're coming. It's going to happen. Somebody's going to cross you. Somebody's going to say something to you. Somebody's going to make fun of your Christianity. Somebody's going to make fun of your haircut. Somebody's going to make fun of something about you, and when it happens, you shouldn't be surprised. That's what he's saying. You're going to be offended. You are going to have your feelings hurt. Now, we're living in a world today. People are offended. They're doing all kinds of stuff. All kinds of things. I'm not going to dignify here at this point in time. You watch the news. It's ridiculous. It's incredible. It's amazing. You can't change history. I'll just say that and move on. Because if I get stopped right here, I'm liable to preach a while, and I don't know how much Bible I'll get in. I'm just telling you something this morning. We've got to wake up and realize something, that treating other people like we want to be treated matters. And whenever we're offended, we don't have to go out and tear stuff up because we're mad. Good night. If I went out and tore something up every time I got mad, I, I wouldn't have nothing left. Or you wouldn't have nothing left. Somebody wouldn't have nothing left. I'd tear something up. But it don't make sense to me. It, does, it doesn't make sense at all. And I, I understand why they're mad. I, I actually do. I understand why they're mad, but I don't, I don't understand the response. Now, watch this. Now, what he talked about it would be better if they'd hang a, hang a stone around their neck and drown them. But watch this. This is how serious this is. Now, this, before I read it, Let's make sure we're clear. This is figure of speech. This is hyperbole. This is hyperbole. Or hyperbole, as one pastor said one time reading his notes. We, we tease him for a while. It, he, it's okay. Hyperbole. Hyperbole is saying something outrageous, outlandish to make a point. Okay, so I don't want nobody to come back in next Sunday with an eye patch on. If you do, as a joke, that's funny. I'll take that. But if you walk in the eye patch next week because you poked your eye out because you looked at something you shouldn't have looked at, I'm not telling you to literally go do that. But here's Jesus' point about it. Watch this. Jesus says, if your eye calls you to do sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. It is better for you to enter into life with one eye rather than having two eyes be cast into hellfire. That's how serious he is about this. Again, he's not expecting you to go pluck your eye out and make yourself blind. What he's saying is it'd be better for you to, to not have the eye than it would be to wind up in hell because of your sin. It's a point he's making. And chances are, out of the nuts in this world that, that read stuff and hear stuff, there's probably somebody that has poked an eye out because of something like that. If they did, I hope they get to heaven and get that eye back. I figure that's how it works. I think you get to heaven and you get everything back. Whatever you lost, but I'll have an appendix in heaven. I'll have tonsils in heaven. Don't know I didn't need them here. Don't know if I'll need them there. Maybe I won't get them back. But you got people that lost a limb, that had some incident, some accident, something wrong with them. They did lose an eye or they lost an ear or whatever else. And they get to heaven, I think it all comes back. I think you're back to I think you're back to 100 percent That's just my opinion. And I, that's 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 my story, and I'm gonna stick to it. But I'm just telling you something this way. I think that it's gonna be heaven's gonna be so much more than we can ever think or imagine. We don't have any idea how great it's gonna be. And we can't we can't fathom it in this side on this side of glory. We get to heaven, you know, what's the what's, uh, 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 amazing grace? When we've been there 10,000 years, shining like the sun, we'll have no less days to sing God's praise. Than we, you know what I'm telling you, 10,000 years, 100,000 years, all of eternity, I think it's still going to be like, wow, this is just the most amazing thing ever. And it's going to be incredible. It's going to be amazing. Everything about it's going to be amazing. The chocolate's going to taste better. The fried chicken won't make you fat. I mean, it's going to be amazing. It is going to be incredible for all of eternity. And I'm telling you, every bite's going to be, you know, you ever eat with some of these people once in a while that have some kind of special meal or whatever. And, and I, I've been around a few of them. They really, really want to make sure that the, 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 their, their host feels appreciated and they take a bite. Now, I've not done it here. I may do it Friday if somebody brings the right dessert, Carly. 
But, <laughs> but there'll be birthday cake Friday with an anchor on it, probably. That's good. We need that. But chocolate's good. You like chocolate, don't you? It'll be chocolate, too. Praise God. But but you take that bite, and then take a, mmm, mmm, that's so good. There's a stupid movie the guy does that. Every bite, mmm. And finally, the, 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 the dad of the group's finally like, oh, come on. Everybody's bite is not that great. Come on. I'm telling you, in heaven, I, I spun off again. This is, this is another rabbit for you. This is a good one, though. The, the, but I'm telling you, that every bite you take in heaven, everything you see in heaven, I just think you're going around all the time. Ooh, ah, mmm. I mean, it's just it's going to be a constant making some kind of noise of satisfaction, excitement, passion, something that's going to be a part of your life for all of eternity. Again, that's just, that's just me. That's just what I think. You'd be quiet if you want to be quiet, but chances are if you're sitting by me and that annoys you, you're going to want to go some other place in heaven because I'm probably going to drive you crazy. Because I'm sure, I, as much as I like chocolate here, heaven chocolate's going to be so much better. I just can't imagine. It's going to be fantastic. So what do we do about sin? What will we do with sin? Have you ever heard of Dennis Swanberg? Some of y'all seen this. I meant to have it. I actually forgot. Dennis Swanberg is a Christian comedian. The dude's hilarious. And he claimed when he was a kid, he says when he was a kid, and he does impersonation, he does a perfect Barney Five. And that's the prelude to this. But he said his pastor's up and he's preaching. He said, what shall we do with sin? <laughs> And, he, and again, for, for, dramatic, for drama, he said, what? And he got real passionate. Shall we do with sin? And he said, I was sitting there, and he said it again. And he said, in my best, Barney Five. I said, nip it. Nip it in the butt. <laughs> he said that whipping. I'm pretty sure he said that whipping he got was one of the better ones he ever got in his whole life for speaking out in church out of turn. But, uh, but nip, we, we've got to find a way to take care of that. And actually, nip it in the bud. Nip it when it's little and small. When those little boxes are spoiling the vine, get them out of there. You don't want your vine spoiled. So don't let them do it. But here's what Paul writes to the Colossian church. Paul says to them this. He says, if you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth, for you died. And your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Therefore, put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, uh, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which, which is idolatry. Because of those things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience, in which you yourself once walked when you lived in them. Again, who's right in the Colossian church? And these people are struggling. They're having a hard time. They're messing with sin. They're doing things they shouldn't do, acting in ways they shouldn't act. And he said, therefore, you've got to put that stuff out. You've got to put it to death. You've got to kill it. Do you remember what the word taught you? And some of you may have heard this when you first got saved, that the old man passes away and everything becomes new. Let him go. Let him die. Let him be gone because you don't need him anymore because you have life in Jesus Christ. Jesus himself is. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And the work of the Holy Spirit is for us to know him as the way, the truth, and the life. So that we go the right way. So that we speak the truth. So that we live the life, praise God. Hallelujah. Once in a while I get excited. In conclusion, almost. Second Peter chapter 3 is my prelude to the conclusion because I had I got one more passage that's my conclusion. And none of you believe me anyway when I say conclusion. <laughs> Second Peter chapter three, verse eight, but beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord a day is a thousand years, and a thousand years is as a day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Going back again. I'm going back again to my teaching on Revelation. Jesus says, I've got this against you. And I'm coming to judge you. I'm coming, but in the meantime, repent. If you repent, here, here's my imagination on this. And I think I include this in the one for tonight or maybe next week. I can't remember. Or for this Wednesday or next week. I don't remember which one. I'll have done two weeks ahead. My imagination on this is Jesus, he's got those feet of brass, right? Even then, it's like, you know, heavy shoes. Why? Because he's slow coming. But when he comes, he's going to come and he's going to judge us one way or the other. And it's either going to be good job 
Thank you. Glad you repented. Glad you got that straight. Or it's going to be, I'm, I'm done. You're out. Go away. I will cast you away from me. I will spew you out of my mouth, he tells the church at Laodicea. We had not got that far yet. But I'm telling you, he wants us to repent. He wants us to live for him. He wants us to stop being burdened by sin because once we give Jesus Christ our heart and life, sin shouldn't be an issue. Shouldn't. Capital S-H-O-U-L-D in posture B-T. I don't think I can do that. It shouldn't. Shouldn't be an issue. But sadly, too often it is. And if you have an issue, and there may not be a soul here this morning has this issue, but I don't think God gave me this word this morning for the fun of it. Maybe it's for somebody watching on the internet. I don't know, but I'm telling you this morning, whatever your struggle is, whatever your hang-up is, whatever you're having a hard time with, you don't have to feel like you are not worthy. You don't have to feel like you're, you're messed up. You don't have to feel like you're not good enough or righteous enough or holy enough. It's time to step up and let Jesus Christ's righteousness wash over you, repent of those sins, give those things up, and live a life for Jesus Christ that is victorious and overcoming. And day in and day out, you get up, you look yourself in the mirror and say, yes, sir, yes, ma'am, you did a good job today. Let's keep going. Let's keep going forward. Praise God. Now, in a sincere, serious conclusion. No, I'm serious about this one. Psalm 119. Familiar verses, familiar passage of Scripture. The main one is verse 11. But I can't read a psalm without giving you the, the, everything around it. So, verse number uh, 9 of Psalm 119, 11, it's on your screen. How can a young man cleanse his way by taking heed according to your word? With my whole heart I have sought you. Oh, let me not wander from your commandments. And here's the key on this. Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. If we're going to make up our mind to live for Jesus, the word of God is going to be our guide and our rule. If we don't have it, don't know it. We can't very, be, very well be led by it. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. With my lips I have declared all the judgments of your mouth. I have rejoiced in the way of your testimonies as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and contemplate all your ways. I will delight myself in your statutes. I will not forget your word. Friends, if we're going to overcome, it's not going to be positive confession. It's not going to be reading some preacher's book or some positive confession leader's book or whatever. I, 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 well, I can't say I don't have a problem with some of them because some of them are just not preaching gospel. Um, they're preaching, you know, how to be a better whatever, and that's fine and dandy for somebody. But, but you need somebody that's teaching you and preaching you God's word. And I, there's some on TV today that they just got a program. They don't, they're not, they're not there to talk about Jesus. They're not there to build the church. They're there to build themselves. They're there to sell a book or something else. And you can take that for what it's worth. And if you want to know who I like, don't like, ask me privately. I'd be glad to tell you. I don't hurt your feelings. You, I may, I may. There may be eventually somebody that I say I cannot stand this one because of whatever. I've got a good reason for it. I don't hate them. I don't even dislike them. I'm just not going to listen to them because they're not giving me what I need to have. But this right here, read, read books by authors. I'll, I'll give you some authors that I like and enjoy. I like Francis Chan. I like, I like anything by Black of these. I like uh, Josh, uh, Josh McDowell. His stuff is really good. Um, I enjoy uh, Rick Renner, of course. I mean, if, if, you want, if you want good, solid Bible teaching, there's a ton of his stuff out there. Get you some Rick Renner books. R-I-C-K-R-E-N-N-E-R. -E -E you can find him on YouTube. You can find him on Renner.org. I'm telling you something, this guy, uh, I'll thank Pam, Pam Dury for this. Pam Dury got me started on Rick Renner. And if you're, if you're with us on our Wednesday night Bible study, you are, you're hearing my voice, but you're hearing a lot of Rick Renner come out of it, I can tell you. Anytime you hear me say the Greek word is, if you've heard Rick Renner's voice, go ahead and just put that in your brain because that's where it's coming from. Uh, a lot of that's me, but an awful lot of that is him because he is, he is just so gifted in the way he brings this stuff together. And a lot of what I'm sharing with you is, is his stuff. I love Rick Renner. And, I, I, and if you, if, hands down, you cannot find a flaw with his teaching. I, and I've, I've looked, I've even tried to search, because you can search certain authors on the Internet, and you'll find out real quick a lot of folks don't like them. And they'll rip them to shreds, and they'll bash them and beat up on them and all this stuff. But I searched, is Rick Renner, is Rick Renner okay? And couldn't it just come up with nothing. Just brought up his website and told you how to get to it. I, wonderful, that's good. But you can hit, is so-and-so okay? And you'll find page after page after page. He's a heretic, he's wrong, he's evil, he's bad, he's terrible, he's telling the wrong things, he's a false teacher, whatever. Rick Renner's right on the money. I, I promise you that you can count on him. He won't let you down. But, but, and that's just, there's a little, little help for you there. That's not a commercial for him. I just, I just want you to have good resources. But at the end of the day, you know why I like Rick Renner? Because this is what he's teaching. He's not telling you the gospel according to Rick Renner. He's giving you the gospel according to the gospel. 
And he's taking you even back on some of that kind of stuff because what some of the stuff he does, it doesn't change meaning, doesn't change doctrine, doesn't, doesn't change anything, but it puts emphasis on what's been translated into English and kind of brings you back to understand when you see the word convinced, that's not just being convinced, that is being completely, totally sold out, can't be wrong, everything has to be right, and you'll never do better. I mean, that, it goes beyond that. I mean, it's powerful. The kind of stuff that he that he that he teaches and preaches, like that. I'm not I, I'm not necessarily promoting him necessarily. I'm just telling you, if you're looking for a good resource, you're looking for a good place, some, some good Bible study. He's one I can I promise you won't let you down. I love his stuff, and I'm not and I've not found anything yet that I thought was anywhere close to wrong. Yeah, I love it, and I, and I appreciate it because it's hard to find that stuff today. Because you can read through some stuff, and you'll find out real quick this guy's not everything you thought he was. He, he's not telling you everything, the whole story. He's not giving you the full picture. We can't have that. We can't let that kind of stuff into our heart. Because false teachers are real, false doctrines are real, and you get caught up in that kind of stuff. I'll tell you how, how I'll tell you how it happens. In the Assembly of God Church, it's our home church. We had people trying to cast demons out of Christians because of what they read in the book. Some author wrote about, about casting demons out of Christians. If you had the sniffles, you had a demon of the sniffles. If you had oh, I bet the COVID really set them off. Lord, it's one of they ain't cast it out. They tried to cast it out of the whole world because it needs it. If that was possible, that'd be great. But just because you got sniffles don't mean the devil showed up. Just because you got the flu. Now, I don't know what the flu is. May, that may be 100% devil. I, I've had the flu one time in my life. That may be 100% true. But I'm telling you something this morning, friends. We have the power to overcome sin. Yeah. We are convinced by the Word of God, convicted by the Holy Spirit, that what we're doing is right or what we're doing is wrong. Now, watch this. Let me, let me close with this. This is good. There's a Holy Ghost moment right there if I've ever had one. The Holy Spirit, when we think about being convicted, convinced, it's always negative, right? He's convicted me because I'm wrong. He's convicted me because I said, because I did. Because I, but he also convicts us or convinces us, same word, it's interchangeable, convinces us when we're doing good. He convinces us that that prayer life is a good prayer life. He convinces us our time of the word is precious and valuable and wonderful. He convinces us, convicts us, and shows us the proof that that, Word is going to help us and bless us because it does help us and bless us. Yeah. So it's not just the negative. So if the Holy Spirit has convinced you of something, it could be that you convinced that you are righteous and holy before God because you are living that life for Him and that you have put away the junk. Put away the junk. Praise God. Father, I love you so much and I'm so grateful for your word and for your promises. And I'm thankful this morning for the life that we have in you. And I ask you to speak to lives and hearts this morning, Father. You know you know each one in this room. You know those that are watching right now. And I believe you today to touch us and help us. Father God, that if there's sin in our lives, we will, we will, we will feel conviction of that by the Holy Spirit, because we already do. And we'll, we'll get that stuff forgiven. Ask you, God, to forgive us and bless us and help us to overcome it. And we'll go forward from here in power and victory and strength, convinced, Lord God, of your righteousness and your justice and your holiness alive in us each and every day. Bless us and touch us this morning in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Heads bowed, please. Eyes closed just for a moment. And to those that are watching on the internet, do you know Jesus Christ as your Savior? If you say this morning, I don't, but I want to. I just want to ask you today in the room, if anybody needs to just say, God, I, I, I need to rededicate my life, or I want to ask you to my life for the very first time, anyone at all, just lift a hand up and right back down. If you're watching on the internet this morning, y'all bear with me here in the room. And you need Jesus in your heart. It's a simple prayer, friend. It's this prayer right here. Dear Jesus, I believe you love me. Forgive me of my sin. Help me live for you. And give me the life you want me to have. Thank you for loving me. In Jesus' name, amen. If you pray a prayer like that, the Bible tells us that is confessing the Lord Jesus with our mouth and we are saved. And we have that opportunity to do any time we're ready. And hopefully we're ready this morning to make our decision, to make our mind up. Thank God for his love. Thank God for his grace. Thank God for his mercy this morning. He is worthy of all praise and glory and honor. Hallelujah. This morning here in the house, and if you're at home and have crackers and juice or whatever you would use for your elements, we want to invite you to join us there at home as well. Or wherever you may be on the, around the world today as we receive communion here at the church. And the beautiful thing about receiving communion is that it is a moment where we remember. We remember the body, remember the blood, remember the life that Jesus has given us. And because of that life, we can say today that I'm a believer, that I have Jesus in my life and in my heart. 
We observe open communion here. If you want to receive communion, you're certainly welcome to. Some churches require you to be a member or what have you. But as we receive our communion today, I want you to think about the body. Think about the blood. Think about the life we have because of what Jesus did. We've just spent the last about 30 minutes or so talking about sin and how we've overcome sin and how we have life and have it abundant through him. And it happened because Jesus died on Calvary's cross because he was beaten almost to death beaten so severely he could not even carry his own cross and he gave us life he gave us hope he gave his own body he gave his own blood on Calvary's cross to set us free and this morning as we receive this little piece of bread and this little cup we are doing as Jesus himself said to do we're doing this in remembrance of him to honor his sacrifice, to honor him, and to remember. Just to simply remember what he did for us on Calvary's cross. Thank God for the blood. We've got several songs that we sing usually in times like these. I don't have any of them this morning. We're going to sing God is so good in conclusion this morning, but when you think this morning about what he's done and how he's done it, thank you, brother. Appreciate that. We are thankful for the body, thankful for the blood, thankful for the hope we have in Jesus Christ. These elements, the significance of them is they're representative of the body and the blood of Jesus. And their significance is just in doing this in remembrance, doing this in honor of who he is and what he's done for us. Thank God this morning for the body. Thank God this morning for the blood. I'd like to ask if you can and will, would you stand with me this morning? And let's receive our communion today and our conclusion, our time together. And thank God. Thank God this morning for what he's done for us. Through the, through the word, through the power, through the Holy Spirit that has made us free. We are born again today by the blood, by the power. There's healing for our bodies. There's renewal for our spirit. And I would say to you this morning that there is a need in your body today. I've heard testimonies like this over the years, and I'd love to hear another one today, of someone receiving communion. It's not the power of the cracker or in the juice. It's the power of our faith that moves the hand of God because this little cracker represents the body of Jesus who was stripes was placed in that body for our healing. So if you need healing this morning, as we pray, ask God to touch you and bless you and give you the healing touch you need in your body, whatever that may be. And today as we look to the word, I usually go to 1 Corinthians chapter number um, 11. And I use Paul's words here. As Paul says, I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given things, he broke it and said, Take eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's pray. Father, bless this element. Bless this little piece of bread. Father God, I pray for healing for bodies in this room. I pray for renewal of spirits. I pray for blessings in lives. That by your spirit and by your power today would be renewed and blessed. Thank you for your body. Thank you for the hope we have. And thank you for the life we have in you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's eat the bread. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Father God, I thank you today for your blood. I thank you today, Lord God, that it has washed and renewed us and given us new life. And Father, that as you shed your blood on Calvary's cross, you looked ahead through the ages of time and you saw us. And you knew, Lord God, that we were going to be your children. We're going to ask you into our lives as that blood that you shed on Calvary's cross was shed for us. 
Lord, I pray today, Lord Jesus, for you to bless the cup, bless us as we receive this this morning, as we do this in remembrance and honor of what you've done for us and the life we have in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's drink the cup. I'll conclude that passage with, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you'll proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. And this morning, we proclaim his death to a lost world that needs to know him. That needs to know how good he is and how much he loves us and cares for us. Let's worship him together as we conclude our time this morning. God is so good. God is so good. God is so good. He's so good. Oh. Uh -huh.